Hi again. Uh, some of you might have seen my talk yesterday. I'm Gershon Bazerman. I'm at S&P Capital IQ. Uh, this is on the advanced track, and, and in a sense it is because I think, uh, but it, in another sense, right, this is another sort of soft talk in that there's no code, but there's real ideas in it, um, as in um, it, it's going to be a talk about the philosophy of math and its applications to programming. And when I say the philosophy of math, I don't mean, you know, my personal philosophy of math. I mean, you know, people from the field who talk about it and write books about it and so on. And some ideas from there that I think uh, can translate in useful ways. And uh, so the inspiration for why uh, I thought this would be an interesting talk to give came from two things. Uh, the first is uh, this quote from a Colin McLarty article, which is a wonderful article that I keep going back to on the history of topos theory. And uh, it... it on one of my read-throughs, this struck me. Uh, he has this line. It is natural to attend to mo the most set-like aspects of topoi, to imagine them as derived from set theory, and to do this even without thinking about it. This is how common sense works. Uh, students afflicted with this misunderstanding have trouble escaping the idea that the objects are, quote, really structured sets, and the arrows are, quote, really structure-preserving functions. So they keep looking for the truths, quote, behind the category axioms, instead of learning to use the axioms themselves. They have trouble learning these definitions, not because these are complex definitions, but because they don't believe what the definitions say. And they keep saying, no, what does it really mean? And it really means a set. And it really means you know, a set theoretic arrow. And uh, uh, so I, I, I read this uh, quote from McLarty in this sort of context of teaching students some very abstract math. And simultaneously, um, I was encountering, uh, these are paraphrases. Uh, and, and these are from people every day on the internet. Uh, right? Um, you know, oh, a monad is just another name for a fax. Why didn't you tell me this? That's what it really is. It's not these axioms. Oh, a monad is just a name for sequencing. Why, no, no, it's not that. Oh, a monad is just a way to handle errors. Why didn't you tell me that? And, and so on and so forth. And I said, so, so McLarty's addressing something that we run into a lot, which is, you know, the, 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 the problem of people uh, insisting that they need to know what something really is, and, and they don't believe you when you tell them. And they tell you then it's hard. And it, it's not that it's hard. It's that they just don't believe you, because it can't be that, because that's not a real thing. And, and so this is a problem about abstraction, um, and that we find it, it's hard to teach abstraction, right? And so, so the question I wanted to ask is, why is it so hard to teach abstraction? And uh, is it harder for us in uh, programming to teach abstraction and, uh, than elsewhere? And I think it's in programming, um, we tell people abstraction is unnatural in a certain way um, that we don't necessarily in other disciplines. Um, and so the, the, the idea of this talk is, you know, we import a lot of mathematical ideas and uh, uh, think of ourselves sometimes as engaging in mathematical practice. Other people would disagree. But we haven't imported a lot of uh, metamathematical ideas in the sense of ideas from the philosophy of math, from people uh, who uh, sort of study how people think about and, and teach math. And, 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 and so that leads to a mismatch. And uh, right, uh, you, you can't learn abstraction the same way you learn addition. You don't learn abstraction by rote. Right? I can go through in elementary school and add a whole bunch of numbers on a worksheet and take a test, and now I've learned something about addition. Maybe not its meaning, but the act of it. I can't go through and just abstract a bunch of things on a worksheet and you know, ha now have learned how to think abstractly. It, 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 there's a sort of different um, thing involved when we talk about teaching abstraction. It's not like uh, teaching other things in that sense. It's a way of infusing a way of thinking, not, not, not an act of thinking. Um, and uh, it's a mode of thought. So, uh, the atomist fallacy, uh, right, which is uh, something that uh, sort of philosophers will talk about in some sense, and not, not everyone will say it's a fallacy, uh, is when you want to understand a thing, you understand the things it's made of, and those things are in turn made of smaller things, and those things are made of even yet smaller things. And once you've taken things down to the very smallest things, then you've understood everything about the big thing, right? And uh, so uh, these people are really understanding this printer, <laughs> right? They're going to know what PC load letter means. Right? <laughs> They're understanding the heck out of that printer. Right? Uh, that, that's so uh, there's obviously a missing piece. And uh, uh, the, the, the philosophical uh, response, and there's been a lot of interesting discussions on this, it's got a little small, is um, it generally sort of falls under the realm of, of some version of structuralism. Um, that uh, objects don't exist merely as their constituent elements, but th th it's the arrangements that matter more than what the things are made of inside of them. And uh, there's a lot of examples we can give from the physical world. So the, you know, the quantum world and the classical world, 
but in a sense, the transition is a statistical one. And when you talk about the classical world, you don't understand it in terms of, you know, these sort of, you know, uh, Hilbert state spaces and so forth. You can pass into a different thing. And, and the structure of the quantum interactions is what's important, not the individual ones. Uh, similarly, in uh, computer chips, uh, the movement of electrons and assembler language to move between them is you have a structure imposed by chip engineers. When we think about assembler, right, and sort of close to the metal, as we would call it, that's very different than the actual metal of the electrons, and that the electrons sometimes don't even stay exactly on the paths, but hop around, you know, sort of nearby them. And you don't think about that. You, 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 and, and then that's a sort of, that's a structural phenomenon, right, in a sense. Um, uh, the objects of a theory in general, which are just names, and the model of a theory, which are structured by equational laws. And that, that's a much more mathematical uh, approach. And, uh, and then up in turn, between assembler and higher level languages, uh, you have the same things occurring. And, and, and one can give many other examples. Um, so uh, one element of how people talk about structuralism and so on is uh, there's a sort of tedious discussion of what things really are. And you know, you, you, I don't want to call that a matter of taste, but, it, but it's a matter where it's hard to convince people. You're not sure practically what the effect would be if we could agree what they really were. So, but there's a weak structuralist program, which is whatever your take is on you know, where the reality of things comes from, certainly as a practical matter, uh, if you, you, you need to conceive of certain practices as operating with structures as their objects and not with atoms. And, and that's how people learn these practices, and that's how people use them. So uh, in a sense, you pass from sort of you know, these deeper philosophical questions into almost the sociology of knowledge is sort of the program this goes under. And uh, that overlaps with some philosophy of math. And so in, and, and in a sense, what I'm saying is this is not a philosophical claim, although philosophers will write about it. it it's, just, it's, a, it's a true historical claim about what's happened in 20th century mathematics, um, that this is how people operate. And uh, all right, uh, who here is familiar with uh, axiomatic systems a la Euclid? All right, um, about, well, uh, okay, so I, I'm not sure. I realized I added these slides because I figured it, it, it's, I, it, it's a good way to start things, and I, I don't want to bore the people that know it, but I, I, it might as well just very briefly, right? Uh, here were uh, U Euclid's postulates. His axioms actually came prior, but we're going to call these axioms, sort of. And, you know, and so this is how he gave geometry, and it's arguably the world's first... Uh, formal mathematical system and first axiomatic system. And he says, uh, and, and, and there's something interesting here. He doesn't say it is possible to draw a straight line from a point to any point. His axiom is the act of drawing the line. He says it, the postulate is to draw a line. I postulate drawing a line. I postulate to produce a finite straight line continuously in a straight line. Right? So if you, which, which is, you know, in our modern language, if I have two points, I claim I can draw a line. If I uh, have a line, I claim I can extend it. Uh, can, uh, you know, line and a point, I can make a circle, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and then the fifth one, which is sort of interesting and uh, I'll touch on briefly. Um, now, um, uh, so who's written interestingly about this, by the way, is uh, Rodin, uh, who's got a book, Axiomatic Method and Category Theory. But this is just sort of, axiomatic method is things like this. You have a bunch of these, what we'll call them axioms or postulates, and then you have everything else that you know in, in the system is derived from these and your logical laws and combining them. And all your constructions are built out of these in some sense. Um, now, this underwent a rather drastic change in the 20th century, um, where, uh, and I think I'll come back to that change, but uh, by the time you hit uh, 1950, you have uh, the Bourbaki group, right, which is the, the, the anonymous collective of great mathematicians who, who tried to write a, a, as one. And they wrote an article, they didn't just write books. And this article is called The Architecture of Mathematics from 1950. It's a beautiful article. And they describe what they conceive of as become the modern axiomatic method. That uh, you separate out the principal mainstreams of the arguments. Then you take each of these mainstreams of the arguments separately and formulate them in abstract form and look at their consequences. And um, returning to the theory under consideration, you look at these component elements which have been separated out, and you look at how these components interact. And then, um, and so there's nothing new in this going to and fro between analysis and th synthesis, between separating out sort of and forgetting everything else but certain elements and only looking at those and then taking it back into the world where you had sort of these objects with more structure, um, but uh, in the way it's applied. And another uh, character, uh, uh, Marquise, uh, J.P. Marquise, has written about abstraction. And, and there's a, the axiomatic method he points out is only an element of abstraction. And the abstract method, and there's a difference, is you don't, is, is you take the abstractions as separate from the object. Uh, Euler really believed that he was axiomizing 
the geometry, which I'll get to, right? And it, when you hit the abstract method, what you start with is you start with things that are apparently dissimilar, but it turns out they have something in common. So you need a range of variation, and you have to identify invariant properties over this whole co different collection of things. And uh, the example that's often given is that of rings, where you notice that many different things form rings. And I'll get to that in a later slide. Uh, the thoughts in the slides don't quite match up, because everything connects here. Um, then you ignore particular elements of the properties of each of these different things systematically, so in such a way that you see what they have in common, but not what they have differently. And you forget those. And you say, I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to think about all these things that are different. I'm only going to look about what they have in common. And then I'm going to say, and now I'm going to have an identity criterion that's going to say all the things that are, by only these things they have in common, indistinguishable, I'm now going to identify. And in doing so, I've now created an entirely new class of objects that did not exist before, right? which are the objects that are built out of the commonalities but not the differences, and which are indistinguishable under these commonalities. And, and, and that's uh, the, his summary um, from our case of, of sort of what the abstract method has been in uh, 20th century mathematics and is a relatively new phenomenon, different from axiomatics. And, and so here we come to what I wanted to preview, is uh, Euclid, uh, right, people thought that this axiomatized the geometry. And uh, so people who know about non-Euclidean geometries, yes, no? Right? So the parallel postulate, yeah, this is good, very mathy audience. The parallel postulate um, can be reread as saying, within a two-dimensional plane, given a line and a point not in the line, there is one unique line which will never intersect the other line, right? That, that's a parallel postulate. And of course, it was discovered, um, rather shockingly, that um, you could also modify it to say that there are infinitely many lines that never intersect this line, and then you get a hyperbolic geometry, the, the lines sort of curve away and um, that there are no such lines, and you have an elliptic geometry, and that all of the other axioms held. And uh, this is a discovery that, you know, you thought you had axiomatized something, but it turned out that you had axiomatized a class of things, and you didn't realize this. Um, and the argument that, that I'm going to make is, uh, just as a thought experiment, you can imagine a counter history where people had invented, uh, you know, a Euclidean, um, hyperbolic, and uh, elliptic geometries sort of independently, and then realize later they coincided if, if, if you know, modulo this one axiom. And, and then that would be an example of the abstract method, right? Would be to later, after the fact, recognize these commonalities and derive a theory that was invariant over uh, these differences. And, uh, right, so, so these things I think we, 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 I don't need to make the directions to programming directly, I hope. I hope people are sort of feeling them in their gut already, that what I'm talking about is very relevant. Um, and, but, uh, here's a very simple example. Take a collection of functions and identify the invariant code between them. Systematically forget those elements of the code that are different. Pull out a new function. Pass in those bits that are different. And I believe that we've taught um, the Eclipse IDE, among others, uh, to do this, right? And I can apply the abstract function refactor, right? And, um, and, and this is an example of the abstract method. And then, of course, when Eclipse does it, it doesn't tend to produce beautiful structures such as rings. but but you, you can recognize the, uh, I, I hope you can recognize it. That this, is a, this is in fact a sense of deep commonality um, in what's going on here. And, and that's something that these notions are very fundamental. Um, so let's return to a couple more quotes I love from this Burbaki article, uh, where he talks about uh, the most striking feature of the, they're talking about the abstract, but they, in a sense they mean the, the ab axiomatic, but in a sense they mean what I'm calling the abstract method. The striking feature is you get a considerable economy of thought. These structures are tools, and as soon as you recognize among the elements the common structure, relations which satisfy the axioms of a known type, you have at your disposal immediately the entire arsenal of general theorems which belong to the structures of that type. Right? This should sound very familiar to some people, right? And you know, any of the talks on Scholar's Ed or whatever that uh, you know, we'll, we'll make a very parallel point, right? And and then and, this, and then this is a point that's you know, that, that was well known in 1950, and then uh, is my point. And uh, and this is the point that I think is less well known and I've only started to recognize more recently, but is equally important. Each structure carries with it its own language, freighted with special intuitive references derived from the theories from which the axiomatic analysis derived, described above has derived the structure. And now you get something very different, which is that you can get these transportations between different things and you can take intuitions from one place to a very different place. And so, so the, the purpose of this is not only the, the economy of knowledge, but that it creates unexpected connections. And 
Um, so now I'm going to talk about the unity of mathematics, as many people have called it. That in a sense, uh, many people uh, who are much better at math than me and you know, very serious people have, have pointed out that math, one element of how one can think about math is as, a, a, as the science of discovering um, uh, surprising and outrageous coincidences, right? Um, and you know, th th things that not sh should not be related that are, and, th and the development of a structure of sort of puns almost, right, in, in a systematic way. Um, and the example given by the Bakke article is that you know, people did not con connect uh, complex uh, numbers to the Euclidean plane at first. And when they did, all of a sudden, you know, the, these, you know, and, and now of course we're all taught to do it, so it's hard to imagine that people were thinking of complex numbers purely formally. And they said, wait, I can look at these as points on a grid. And now I can think about functions on this grid, and now I understand the complex numbers in a whole new way. And, and, and that was a moment in mathematics where people had to make that discovery. And that's a very good example of the abstract method sort of leading to something that we now can't, it, it, I can't even imagine what it would be like to not, to not see that, because uh, that's how I was taught these numbers in the first place. Um, more complex examples are the duality of combinatorial and categorical accounts of homotopy spaces, which I won't get into, but it turns out that one way to represent homotopy spaces is through sort of a, a Yoneda embedding, and it's very beautiful. And the other approach is to crank out these enormous combinatorial sequences. And these are the only way, two ways to understand it, and they are in the deep extremes of abstraction here, and on the other hand, you would consider you know, very gritty combinatorics. And, and, and so combinatorics arises in places where you don't expect it, or alternately categories do, and, and, and often they're the same. And so that's very interesting. Um, and here I was going to mention the rings. You, know, you can look at the reals, the geometrical and numerical notions of rings, vector notions of rings, algebraic notions of rings, and formulaized rings, uh, logical uh, things as rings. And I'm scratching the surface. And of course, you get you know, triply derived concepts and schemes of rings. And I, you know, it, uh, it goes on. So it turns out these enormously general concepts, uh, much more than were anticipated, even when they were generalized in the first place. Uh, you know, uh, calculus, right? The, the, the fund, they, they, they spend basically a semester to convince you that the slope of the line and the area underneath it have, have, have a spectacular coincidence that, you know, of course, there's a deep theory as to why, but, but it, it doesn't seem evident to you until you've taken a Cal course necessarily why you should think of these things as intuitively in a deep relationship. So, so math is all about these coincidences. I won't go through them all. I listed a lot more fun ones. Uh, the monstrous moonshine, I don't have time to talk about that. Uh, uh, Blissard's umbral calculus. Anyway, um, sorry, just things to Google later. Uh, let's move on. Um, so uh, I don't know if I have time for this. I thought I'd talk about one example that surprised me. And I don't know if I have time to do this right. Uh, so pe people are no, how many people know what sort of a localization or a completion is in a mathematical sense? All right, uh, I, 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 I'm going to tell the story in a lying way, because otherwise I'll never get away with it in, in this span of time. And there's actually a couple different notions of localization that don't coincide going on here. But start with the naturals, right? Now, the naturals, of course, you, 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 they're not complete with regards to subtraction, because what's uh, you know, 2 minus 5, it, right? You can't do that. So addition doesn't always have an inverse. How do you make addition have an inverse? Well, the classical way you do this is I'm going to have two numbers, and, and two naturals instead of one natural. I'm going to have a pair of them that I walk around with. And if I want to... Um, subtract what, uh, and positive numbers are the ones that are like something comma zero, and negative ones are zero comma something. And then you can work out, if you want to subtract these pairs, that you can represent the subtraction as, you know, in all as a sound way, by just having sort of the pairs of one minus the other. And so you've added a whole bunch of points to your space, in a sense, because, you know, where you just had one number before, now you have two, so you've got a lot more points in your space. But then you quotient those points down again by saying, I identify all pairs as the same, where the difference between them is the same, right? Although you can't exactly say the difference between them because you don't ha yet have subtraction, so you do a slightly different formula that gets you there and stays in the positive world. But it, th th that's an example of a, a, a sort of notion of a localization or a completion is we've gone from something that doesn't have subtraction to a structure built on it through two steps, adding a bunch of points and then identifying a bunch of points um, to a structure that does have subtraction. You do exactly the same procedure with regards to division. And you go from uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, we go from uh, the uh, integers uh, to, to the rational numbers. And in the rational numbers, we actually represent them as a pair, right? Because it's a fraction. So we, we've learned that one, and that's very easy. You just say, well, what is, you know, 
2 divided by 5. Well, it's 2, 5, the pair. And what do we do again? We, we identify classes of them. In this case, the classes where, you know, you know uh, 4, 10 is the same thing. And it's the exact same. So you can see the procedure of going, of completing with regards to addition and completing with regards to division is the same procedure. Um, you get uh, the rationals. Uh, you complete the rationals with regards to Cauchy sequences, uh, which, um, it, and it, it's very much the same thing. You just declare that all these things have limit points, and then you identify the ones where the limit points are the same under some invariant. Um, and now you get the reals. Uh, you complete the reals with regards to roots, uh, almost the same procedure again, and you get the complex numbers. And, and so this, to me, is sort of a second-level abstraction, is that you have one procedure, and you can go from the things, the counting numbers, you know, up, up to uh, the, the, the field of the complex. And you just by iterating it. And, and this is the notion of an abstraction of, um, of a procedure. And you can see how you apply the same thing over and over. And this, uh, this appears in pipe theory in a very surprising way. Um, uh, there's a famous uh, Leinster and Fiore paper. So, uh, you know, everyone that remembers any of the stuff we do in Haskell where you do sort of like this math with the signatures of polynomial functors. And then you get that hilarious result that if we pretend that this uh, polynomial functor, like for list, which is recursive, if we pretend that we can do all the operations of complex numbers on it, right, you can solve the fixed point equation for a list and, and get what it should be. And Leinster and Fiore gave an uh, article that explains in category theory why it's always the case that if you just have a semigroup uh, and you pass through all this other stuff, you can do all the complex operations, and your result is a semigroup, then there always exists a, quote, uh, honest proof of the same thing that doesn't pass through this. And in a sense, it's a surprising result. But if you look at what I presented in the prior page, it's not. Because the entire purpose of every single construction taking us from, right, the, in the history of mathematics, taking us from um, the counting numbers to the complex numbers, was precisely so that you get such a result with regards to numbers, right? Precisely to make everything work out. And so in a sense, it's very shocking. And in a sense, we're digging up what has been buried for us when we discover that we can do this uh, with uh, types as well. Um, that, that was why this apparatus was built. And, and that's an element of the unity of mathematics is that um, it turns out that you, you, there's a lot of structures here that you have to know what you're looking for and know that they were put there to begin with. Uh, and, and then now I'm going to talk about, on the other side, the prism of mathematics, which is uh, the, the second part of that Bourbaki quote. The elements in which you know every field has its own Every way of looking at things, even if it's the same thing, carries an, its own intuitive landscape that, that we navigate. Um, so uh, if you look at the same system categorically, you can think about diagram chases, uh, commuting paths, uh, maybe Yoneta, uh, certainly Yoneta. Um, if you think of the same space homotopically or the same object, and you can take any mathematical object and look at it in different ways, you're going to be looking at sort of ways to glue them and to uh, uh, maybe split them, and I, I won't explain what all this means, so I don't have time. Uh, in topological point set thinking, where you have a lot in computer science, this is what we actually were talking about last night, some of it at the pub, right? Is it's all going to be about semi-decision procedures, and things that you certainly know, but maybe don't know, right? So they're open or closed in a topological sense, in one way or another. And an example of this that comes up in practical programming is the notion of something like a bloom filter. A set where you can certainly know if something is a member, but you maybe know that it's not a member, but maybe you'll actually think it's a member when it's not. And then you get a great deal of data compression. And, and we use these algorithms all the time. And we also have semi-decidable questions like halting. I certainly know, well, well, well rather, if it halts, I certainly know it's halted. And there are certain things that I certainly know won't halt, but then there's things that, you know, are semi-decidable. I'm, I'm doing a bad job. But you, you can, there's a topological translation of that stuff. So, you don't have to think of it topologically, but if you like your topological intuitions, then you can translate them. And then you can look at it logically in a whole different theory. It's the same object. You have a whole new set of intuitions to bring to bear on it. Uh, harmonic analysis, computational thinking, combinatorial thinking, which I'm not very good at, but I always marvel at their proofs and then the people that can think in terms of those theories. Um, so, gosh. Uh, now I'm going to take a big jump. Um, th th in a sense, this is things that interest me that loosely fit together in this talk, and I think are things we can draw from. Uh, I, I was reading uh, Bill LeBaer, as some people know I'm a fan of his work, in a more, an 1992 article, Categories of Space and Quantity. And he said something that completely baffled me. Um, he, he was talking about Aristotle's program of using um, philosophy to lend clarity, directedness, and unity to the investigation and study of science. And all of a sudden, he talks about 
Hepside's 1887 struggle for the proper role of theory in the practice of long distance telephone line construction. I said, I, I was not aware of this. Um, so I, I went and I found the Happy Side article and started reading about this gentleman. And uh, he really is uh, as interesting a figure as, um, a, uh, as an Edison or uh, a, uh, a Tesla or the other people people like to talk. I, I would urge people to read about Happy Side's biography. It's a fascinating man. Um, in fact, did you know that Maxwell's equations are the Maxwell Happy Side equations? Maxwell gave us, depending on who you believe, between 8 and 20 equations. And they used uh, Cortinons. Uh, Heaviside uh, translated that into the four vector equations we know and love today. Uh, and he's entirely self-taught, although his uncle was a Wheatstone of the Wheatstone Bridge, so he, he had some help. Uh, but he came from a very working class background. He worked on the Anglo-Danish uh, telegraph cable, and you know, and it was, it was, he worked on it. And, um, and then uh, he invented things such as the coaxial cable, uh, the theory of transmission lines. Uh, anytime you see a loop in a wire and, the, and a, like an antenna, that come, have a side sort of pioneered why you would want to put those things there. And that's what leads to LaVeyre's remark, in fact. Uh, there's also the operational calculus, uh, uh, which is uh, the sort of uh, the, the notion of differential operators, and, which the mathematicians hated, by the way, because he, he, uh, have a side just said, what if we treated these things like this? And people said, well, but, but they're not. He said, yes, but look what we could do. And uh, he never proved it. And, uh, <laughs> but he used it to great effect. Uh, and so uh, Norbert Wiener, who's a, a fan of Heavysides, had said, the brilliant work is purely heuristic, devoid of even the pretense to mathematical rigor. Its operators apply to electric voltages and currents, which may be discontinuous and certainly need not be analytic. But he did it, and it worked. And later on, the math caught up with him. So th that, that's one element of the role of uh, theory and, and practice in math, all right, is when you want to say you want to be mathematical, that doesn't mean that you have to respect only the mathematics that exists. Sometimes you just want to make the thing transmit on the line faster, right? And, and then you have to invent math to do it, and that's okay. Saying you're mathematical doesn't mean you're uh, sitting at the feet of the ancients. And uh, I won't go into the operational calculus more. Uh, but the dispute in particular that Lever referred to is Priest, who was another important person in telegraphy at the time, and telephony, and others. They, they considered un induction the worst thing, right? Because um, you know, if you want an electrical signal to transmit, then you have to eliminate all this magnetic interference. So any inductance is the worst thing, because clearly you know, we want the signal, not the interference. And Heaviside said, well, that, you know, you, you've studied some things and, um, you know, in a practical world, but well, I, I'm just looking at the equations very seriously. And it seems that if we add uniform inductance, then that'll actually reduce the distortion because it'll sort of have the signal boosting against itself. And people said, this is insane. We've been fighting inductance for years and you want to embrace it, you know? And um, he wrote these articles for a journal called The Electrician. And uh, actually, a priest had the editor of The Electrician fired um, and the new editor refused to print at Heaviside's articles. And, and Heaviside was, was, was similarly discourteous to priests. This is a very heated argument over inductance. Uh, uh, I, I don't really have time to get into this, so I want to get to the conclusion. But I, it, I, it's an interesting digression that I think is relevant to us in a way. Because you know, one can make the analogy right, between, you know, here, here's a man who's, who's interested in very practical things. You know, transmission of uh, telephony signals over long distances. And he has to reach into theory. And when he does so, uh, the mathematicians don't necessarily like everything he's doing. Because he has to sort of uh, find new ground there. And the practitioners don't like everything he's doing. Uh, but, but he persists, and, and, and a lot of his ideas in the end uh, ended up uh, changing the world. So this is, uh, when one talks about abstraction and the unity of math and so forth, right, this is sort of, there's these figures that I think are just in interesting, inspiring historical lessons. I don't know what else to take away from it. Um, and he has this quote that uh, is the one that Lavere picked up on, on his article on inductance, where he says uh, that, uh, we shall never know the most general theory of anything in nature, but we may at least take the general theory insofar it is known and work with that, finding special cases whether limited theory um, will not be sufficient and keeping within bounds accordingly. And Lavere translates that in his article. Right? This is the quote that I now found that lets me understand Lavere's quote, right? that we don't have the final answers in any of these theories, but we always have to reach for the best theory we have, even if that means reaching a bit beyond our comfort zone and, and thinking of things in a bit more complicated way than we would necessarily want to if we want to um, really sort of do the best we can. Um, and here we go. Um, 
a lot of quotes, it's an assemblage of quotes I like as much as anything else. Uh, Rhoda in Indiscreet Thoughts uh, points out that he sees there as two sorts of mathematicians, the problem solver, who uh, wants to solve one problem at a time. He wants to solve the problems that no one else thinks can be solved. And once he's solved it, he doesn't care how he solved it, right? It's done. On to the next one. And then there are other people who are the theorizers. We don't really care about problems. Um, they want a theory that sheds light on phenomena. Uh, they don't, success does not lie in solving problems, but in trivializing them. <laughs> the moment of glory comes with the discovery of a new theory that does not solve any of the old problems, but renders them irrelevant. And perhaps introduces a bunch of new problems, which he doesn't mention. Um, Rhoda's not taking sides here. Um, again, this should be very familiar to many of us in many discussions over uh, how we write software libraries and uh, think about our programs. And so this sort of is the last section of the talk is um, there were a lot of it, right? There was a rather stupid argument. Is programming mathematics that took place uh, uh, back and forth at some conferences? Uh, I don't know if that's an interesting argument. An interesting question is, how are programmers like mathematicians? And how are mathematicians like programmers? And this is like a social phenomena. This isn't a, but, but you could, if you recognize the same social phenomena in many ways, you have to say the object of study has to, in some sense, be similar enough to engender the same sort of uh, prism of responses. Um, so here's, here are some uh, disparaging ways in which mathematicians are like programmers, right? They're, they're going to argue over you know, the generality of their approach. They're going to have mutual theories that all say the same thing, but one is clearly correct and the other is clearly wrong. <laughs> and you look at the history of math, it's full of this. Uh, they debug proofs, and they will talk about it in that sense now. right? They, they, they will talk about uh, fundamental and uh, debuggable flaws in their proofs. Uh, they will refactor their proofs, which is much better. Uh, they will accrue and play, pay down technical debt in their theories. Um, and then they will, as, as well, argue endlessly about syntax. And they will write articles that are mutually unintelligible to one another that are saying the same thing. Right? So, so in good and bad ways both, there are a lot of elements that uh, should be familiar to us as programmers in mathematical practice. Um, programmers also are a lot like mathematicians. We, we see the abstract method uh, pervasively, uh, maybe in sometimes boring ways, maybe in more complex ways. Um, uh, like mathematicians, if you ask two programmers uh, what programming's about, you'll get four answers, right? Um, so uh, no one can really tell you. Um, uh, you can uh, take the same problem that's already been solved and uh, you know, talk about different ways to solve it uh, for years and years and years and find that enlightening. Um, you can um, place emphasis on elegance and economy of results, just as mathematicians often do. And uh, you can very often accidentally rediscover known results, which I think is the hallmark of mathematics. Uh, that, uh, no, in a good way, right? That, that you understand things once you accidentally rediscover them. And, and we see this in programming as much as math. Um, so, so here's my punchline insofar as I have one. I believe we should teach programming from what I had introduced as a weak structuralist standpoint, which is to accord programming concepts the same uh, status as mathematical concepts. Tell people they're abstractions from the start. Tell people that programming is abstractions in the sense I've been describing, and that's OK. And, and this is what I mean is I believe that in some sense, right? we have a notion of our machines sort of in some steampunk sense that, you know, whether or not they're actually, you know, they're chips and so on now, like, right? it, it's a machine and, I don't know, maybe you put in the quarter and turn the handle and the steam comes out of it and the gears turn and, and you are directing this physical object and therefore it must be concrete. And these abstractions cannot be the close to the metal that people speak of, right? And, and, but that's not really the case. It's just not. And, you know, whenever, pe and, and, and it, people have a hard time learning if they can't let go of that. So, uh, right, we need to sort of just, encouraged from the start that, you know, n nobody, very few people will claim that mathematics is really, you know, counting the rocks. There's an element of it, but they know that it's more than that, and they're taught that from a young age. So why can't we let them know that programming is just the same? And, and whether or not they deeply believe it, they should at least believe it for the sake of learning new things for the time being, just contingently believe it. Um, and that there's an element of invention, right? We don't discover it. In a sense, you discover, in a sense, you create, and there's, um, we're making up the rules of the game as we go. That's the mystery of the abstract method. And that's something that's lovely in programming and math in both ways, is uh, we invent the rules, but we don't know how to play the game, right? Um, we get to, and, and, and a lot of uh, discoveries are about discovering what you put in there that you didn't realize you had put in there. Um, and um, so, you know, the, it's the art of making things up uh, with some consistent, uh, consistency in how you make things up, but also uh, you know, not a consistency in what we mean by that term consistency. Um, 
right? It's, it's Calvin Ball, or it's building robot friends and talking to them. And I don't think we teach uh, people about programming in that sense. Um, and so I think improving the discipline of uh, programming means encouraging mathematical thinking. Uh, but simultaneously, encouraging mathematical thinking means demystifying mathematics. And encourage it, right? And, and, uh, and functional programming is a place where the two can meet. And uh, da, 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 uh, I, I guess I'll end there. Uh, thanks for your time. <laughs>